McLean. I'm the President and CEO of the Greater Kitchener Waterloo Chamber of Commerce. Uh, it's a pleasure to have all of you here today to join us and to take time out of your busy schedule to support the Chamber in this important event. For those of you that haven't attended this event before, this forum is, has been designed uh, throughout the years to be an interactive and content oriented event to try and bring you the face to face with experts and, and um, business owners so that they can share with you practical information uh, that you can implement right away, saving energy and saving you uh, time and being environmentally progressive. Um, we hope you've had time to uh, check out the exhibits at the back of the room. There'll be some more time once we conclude the event. Uh, so make, make sure you uh, uh, check out the, the exhibitors at the back of the room. These events, like this event, like all other chamber events, wouldn't happen without the generous corporate support of our community sponsors. I'd like to recognize our title sponsor for today, Kitchener Wilmot Hydro and Water to North Hydro. I think uh, Jeff is here for, with some of his gang. Our gold sponsor today is, is Tepperman's. Silver sponsor is GHD. And our community sponsor, Sustainable Waterloo Region. I'd like to just uh, introduce a couple of members, uh, past members of our board of directors, actually, and past chair Murray Costello, Union Gas and Enbridge Company. Got that right there, Murray. Uh, so he was, uh, he, he didn't fire me when he was chair, so I thank you for that. Thank you, Murray. And another past chair, Brian Bennett, who's now with the City of Kitchener, and he didn't fire me either. So welcome, uh, Brian. Thank you for joining us today. And Stephanie Sulis from uh, Little Mushroom Catering, who is a great chamber member, was a past member of the, of the Board of Directors of the Greater KW Chamber. Our event season is slowing down for the summer. Please check out our website for more information, but we do have a golf scramble in August, and we're, um, we still have some foursomes available, as well as off to the races in July, which is a great uh, night at uh, Alora Raceway. So bring some of your staff, friends, colleagues. It's a, it's a fantastic evening. Um, you can follow the Chamber website or, or follow us on tri uh, Twitter for the fall lineup. There's lots coming up. We'll have a series on economic development here in the region of Waterloo, with partnering with our Waterloo Economic Development uh, Corporation, uh, as well as we'll have a political leader series in the lead up to the next provincial election. So we'll be hosting Premier Wynne, uh, Patrick Brown, and uh, Andrea Horvath in the fall. Uh, and then our regular series like the NBS and the um, Business After Five will be recommencing in September. So uh, I'd like to, without further ado, I'd like to, uh, to just invite, I'm going to invite our panelists up one at a time because they've got probably five or six minutes each of, uh, of some opening comments, and then I'll, I'll lead a um, uh, sort of a Q&A once they're all completed. So to begin with, I'd like to invite or uh, to introduce and invite up Claire Bennett. She is the manager of sustainability office at Wilfrid Laurier University. There she's responsible for strategic planning and project management spanning business and facilities operations, capital planning, education, and community partnerships. Laurier's sustainability program is consistently recognized both locally and internationally. Claire is a recipient of the 2017 Canada Clean 50 Emerging Leader Award. Her background spans private, nonprofit, and public sector roles. She is active in the community climate planning and, and mitigation, and she is a mem current member of the Climate Action Waterloo Region's ICI subcommittee and is a former chair of its leadership committee. Claire holds a master's degree from the University of Waterloo School of Planning, where she researched the area of sustainable management systems and smart design, and continues to publish and present on the topic. She is currently in the process of getting her designation as a registered planning professional. So welcome, Claire, and the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, so I guess I don't need to introduce myself, but I think why I'm here and what I'll be chatting about for the most part is um, the energy management project that I'm overseeing, particularly on a strategic level. So Laurier really is taking a cutting edge um, in dealing with our energy management because we see it very much as an issue um, around risk and resiliency. So we're taking on a three-phase $55 million energy management project. We've actively started implementing in late, it was December 2015, but it's been a long process. Um, the process has involved obviously developing the business case, and we'll likely talk a little bit more about that in detail, but it included engaging the Laurier community, specifically from the academic side, so that's our MBA program, engaging them on and helping to develop the business case because this is what we'll present and what we did present to our senior leadership. So we had to go through that. We had to 
as you know, do the um, procurement process required, uh, set up the format of what we wanted to, um, the approach we wanted to take, which was for us an ESCO model. We're an institution, so I'll probably chat more about that, but an ESCO um, energy service contract or an energy ser service company was the best model for us at the time, particularly because we are a long-term entity, um, but also um, it provided us with the necessary measurement verification process that we needed, which we hadn't quite established at that point, but we further developed on. So from this, of course, we selected a proponent, uh, had to set up the legal requirements for anyone who knows about ESCOs or is involved on um, those side of things. It's a very uh, in-depth legal back and forth. Um, and then we were able to establish a set of ECMs, energy conservation measures, and we are full on and we finished phase one. We're under, we've started phase two a few months ago as well as simultaneously, a we have th phase 3A and 3B, and I'll, and I'll probably chat about this um, maybe more with questions, but it's because of funding that we're getting. Um, external funding, uh, a lot of some incentive programs as well, so we've broken out the phasing, uh, the phases and had to do it based on time timelines. Uh, government timelines being very strict and reporting being monthly, more strict than it's ever been. So a lot of uh, interesting cases with that. But the project is very progressive, just to finalize. It um, goes from simple stuff, weather stripping, fixture upgrades, the stuff that you would normally do to um, doing a fully integrated microgrid with power storage, renewables, and Laurier's first central plant, a cogen system, which is highly needed at Laurier. And I can obviously talk about the reasons why, but we've been operating on kind of isolated boiling boiler units, and that's just not, not the best strategy for a growing campus. So I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. I'd like to invite uh, Julian Hayward. He's a professional engineer and associate with GHD. He has worked extensively as a project manager in the U.S., Canada, and the U.K., uh, and across Europe. His experience includes various aspects of environmental assessment and engineering and providing sustainability-related services, including sustainable remediation design, emissions control, and waste management systems. Uh, also includes greenhouse gas assessments and auditing and verification related to environmental performance indicators. Mr. Hayward's experience also includes environmental site assessments, environmental compliance, risk assessment, and litigation support. Mr. Hayward has undertaken projects in multi multiple business sectors, including mining, manufacturing, chemical production, wood preservation, or wood preserving, food processing, and property development. His U.S. experience includes projects under federal and state environmental programs, involves operational facilities, former waste uh, hazardous waste sites, and solid waste management facilities. His Canadian experience includes similar projects for operational and closed industrial facilities conducted under both provincial and federal standards. His UK and European experience includes providing services to the UK and North American based clients relating to operational facilities and brownfield development, all of which is very relevant to us here in the region of Waterloo. Welcome, Julian. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, it's great to be here. Thanks very much, Ian. So um, I've got a, a few slides that hopefully everybody can see okay, and I'm going to uh, advance them from here. Um, I'll warn you that I started out with probably something like 100 slides, and I was quickly told that that was going to be too many. So, so I, I, I did uh, uh, pare it down considerably. So I'll be going fairly quickly. Uh, the slides I have are actually, there's two sets of slides. One is just introduction to who GHD is, and I'll try and be very brief about that. Uh, the second part relates to sustainability metrics and reporting, which I thought might be topical, and it's an area that I, I've been found myself working in quite a lot recently. So, uh, first of all, GHD, we uh, provide engineering, uh, environmental and construction services. Uh, graphic here has some kind of basic details about who we are. Some of you may know GHD uh, by name. Some of you may recognize us by our former name, Conestoga Rovers and Associates. Uh, we're working on a worldwide scale. We have uh, in excess of 200 offices comprising over 8,500 employees. 400 of those employees happen to be right here in Waterloo Region. Uh, as a company, we work in what we call five global market areas, which you can see here, uh, fairly typical from an engineering and environmental standpoint. Water, energy and resources, environment, property and buildings, and transportation. 
And when you drill down further into the work we're doing, it's divided into a uh, fairly long list of services, as you can see here. I'm not going to go into too many details other than to say that uh, all of these services relate in one way or another to the global markets that we serve in those five broad categories. Um, so um, I'm just going to talk briefly about the type of projects we're doing without going into much detail. Uh, water projects typically involve uh, anything from water uh, supply, water distribution, water treatment, uh, and up through wastewater treatment, through the, so the whole cycle of water usage. And uh, I might just point out uh, something that's shown on the slide that's perhaps relevant to our theme today, which is a, um, uh, a biogas recovery uh, uh, and cogeneration facility that's associated with a wastewater treatment plant, which uh, in uh, the case of this picture happens to be in uh, Pennsylvania, right in the middle of the photo there. Uh, in the energy and resource category, while well, we do a lot of work related uh, with electrical engineering, power generation, and uh, the resource sector, mining being a, a primary component. I'll just point out uh, perhaps on the, uh, on the view that you can see there on the upper left-hand side, there's a large piece of power generation equipment which is associated with uh, landfill gas recovery uh, and utilization as a renewable energy source. And there's quite a number of those projects that we've been involved in over the past 10, 20 years or so. Uh, environment, we have a long history working in environmental, ranging all the way from emergency response through site assessment, uh, brownfield uh, site, site investigation, brownfield redevelopment, uh, and waste management. And then complementing all of that, we work in property assessment, building sciences, uh, as well as transportation, roads, bridges, in, uh, utilities, infrastructure. So that's it for GHD. Um, this, this is a topic that I wanted to uh, explain a little bit because it's an area that I've worked in uh, quite a lot recently. A lot of my clients, the clients that I work with, are in, are in, in the industrial and manufacturing sector. And so they have obviously a sort of a, a unique set of uh, circumstances, compliance issues and problems that they deal with. Uh, but uh, from time to time and, in, and increasingly, we get questions concerning sustainability performance and how they can uh, assess what they're doing and improve. And we usually start out that discussion by trying to determine what stage they're at in their so-called sustainability journey. And I think this is a kind of a useful graphic because it kind of explains different stages all the way from com uh, basic compliance level up through a higher level of a sustainability plan and uh, reporting program. Uh, but when we talk to people invariably we find that they're somewhere around stage three. They have compliance issues under control but they're very interested in looking at how they can improve beyond basic compliance, looking at uh, ways to become efficient and uh, avoid different sorts of uh, regulatory threats and respond to drivers that exist. And when we, when we go through that discussion, uh, typically they want to talk about, well, how, how do we measure this? How do we determine where we are? How do we track this going forward? Uh, so there's a, a set of metrics and key performance indicators that we, that we try and get people focused on. And, um, my experience revolves around the use of a framework that's called the Global Reporting Initiative, or GRI, that people may be familiar with. It's, it's really, I think, sort of the de, de facto reporting standard. Um, it's been around for a while. It's in its fifth generation now. And uh, all through its evolution, it um, has a common element, which is it has a, a, a defined set of aspects that are considered as part of uh, looking at key performance indicators, broadly categorized as either economic, environmental, or social. Um, I didn't try and list them out here, obviously, but I did identify within the environmental category some of the, some of the 12 that are identified in the, the guidance document. Uh, the, the, the guidelines are very prescriptive, and some people would say probably too prescriptive, but there is an, a very important principle behind all of it, which is identified here as the materiality principle. So as you can see from what it says there, uh, the report that is a sustainability report should cover 
aspects that reflect the organization's significant economic, environmental, and social impacts, or substantively influence the assessments and decisions of stakeholders. So that's, so that's a, um, you know, that, that's a two-dimensional test, essentially. And it, it, uh, it's a simple concept. Uh, really, uh, it boils down to making sure that when you look, are looking at this type of thing to focus on what is important. Uh, easier said than done sometimes just because of different viewpoints of different stakeholders. So we typically need to go through an, uh, an activity or an exercise of trying to prioritize and identify what these material aspects are. And this graphic just simply shows, uh, similar to the, what was shown on the previous slide, this two-dimensional element of x-axis being significance to the organization and the y-axis being significance to stakeholders. And the concept simply is that each aspect or topic would be prioritized, scored in a way that, can, that it can be plotted out. And then those that rise to the top on either the x or y-axis are those that would be considered material issues, topics that, that warrant uh, consideration from a reporting and metric standpoint. Um, I just threw uh, some examples on here uh, of broad category aspects so you can see kind of where things might shape out. Obviously, it's all, all dependent on the circumstances of the organization, how they, how they respond or react with their uh, stakeholders, what their views are, and, and how that all comes together in this fashion. So um, I just want to kind of wrap that up by saying that the, the, the message here is that if you're considering uh, sustainability reporting, looking at metrics, then it's really vitally important to consider this materiality principle. Um, it's it's assent very essential to the, the core of sustainability reporting. Um, nonetheless, we see quite a lot of circumstances where uh, there isn't enough attention paid to that, the significance of, uh, you know, materiality, and uh, it, it is often downplayed or overlooked. So, food for thought. Thank you. Well, thank you, Julian, and, and I think and GHD is another example of a, uh, a local company that started local but has now got global reach both across North America and around the world. And, and in areas that are important to us here in the region of water, certainly water being a, a huge uh, component, brownfield in, in uh, a redevelopment in, in our community where we're going to hit our hard boundaries in the, in, and, and have to do more brownfield redevelopment. So having that expertise here in, in the community is, is very important. Um, next, I'd like to introduce uh, and welcome Andrew Tepperman. Te Andrew is, the, uh, is one of the owners of Tepperman's Furniture and one of the, and one of the six guiding principles at Tepperman's over their 92 years in, as a family business is to be a leader in environmental sustainability. And as president of the company, uh, the, Andrew lives this every day. He left, you know, or he left Windsor in 1984 to attend Upper, Upper Canada College in Toronto. Then he went to Vassar College in New York State. Uh, with a degree in political science. I'm a big fan of degrees in political science. There's a lot of applications for, I'm just kidding. There's, I have one too, but uh, uh, <clears throat> we survived anyways. You have economics, which actually is useful. So, uh, But he also attended uh, Dartmouth University and the American University in Paris. From 1993 to 1997, he worked at Berkline Corporation in the United States, uh, which is the, and, and Sorry, and then having acquired the largest independent furniture retailer in London, Ontario, he re relocated there for the next three years. In 2000, he returned to Windsor, and in 2006 was appointed president of Tepperman's. In 1998, Andrew helped establish the Tepperman Scholarship Trust, and to date, over 600 scholarships have been awarded to children across Ontario. In 2008, he spearheaded the development of Tepperman's new 185,000 square foot retail and distribution facility in London. Uh, and in 2013, he received the Large Business Award from the Windsor Chamber of Commerce. In 2016, he opened their newest facility here in Kitchener, as well as receiving an award from the London Chamber of Commerce in Environmental Leadership. In May, 19, uh, May 2017, he and his team broke ground on a new state-of-the-art retail facility in Sarnia and a 1.9 million um, square foot expansion of their London distribution facility, solidifying them as the largest family home furnishings retail business in Ontario. Welcome, Andrew. So welcome, everybody. Thanks for uh, allowing me to share some of our environmental uh, insights with you this morning. 
I also, like uh, Julian, I also had about 100 slides as well. So I cut it down to about 20 just to save you some time. Uh, but environmentalism for, for retail in general, you don't see this a lot out there today, corporate so social responsibility um, that's formalized like what we've done. Um, and it really started, we've, we've always been involved with uh, sustainable programs, but about three years ago, my brother convinced me to go to Ann Arbor, Michigan uh, with him for, to learn about environmentalism and developing guiding principles. And so three years ago, it really resonated with us more than ever. Uh, so we, we brought it back to the company and uh, our 450 employees really jumped on coming up with some interesting ideas uh, that we could do to implement environmentalism around, uh, around Ontario. What's really interesting is, this is just, I'm not gonna read this, but it's an email a Kitchener customer just sent me a couple weeks ago. And they were driving by our Kitchener store on Fisher Hallman in Huron, and they found out we had an electric car charging station there. And so the guy sent me an email just to tell me he was basically on the way to buy appliances at Lowe's, but because we had this charge station, he came in and bought $5,000 worth of appliances for, for us. So there's an ROI with some of this as well. Um, we do a staff survey every year, and the sixth question on our staff survey talks about, you know, is environmentalism important to you? And sure enough, every year, um, our staff rate sustainability higher and higher. Um, so this is something that's really becoming more mainstream these days, and the more companies that can jump on this, I find, it's going to uh, improve your businesses as well. We actually have a vision at, at Tepperman's, a company vision, and the first you know, sentence says, Tepperman's a trusted community, an environmentally conscious leader. That's the opening to our vision. It doesn't talk about selling sofas or profitability. It's about community and environmentalism. We, uh, we have a very formal environmental um, statement. It's one of our six guiding principles, as well as community and, cust and customer and, and uh, employee experience. So it's really become formalized in our company. It's, um, it's, it's part of our DNA now, I would say. It's not forced. It's um, it, every department and every person lives it. Uh, Ian mentioned what really kicked it off too was about a year ago when we won the uh, London Chamber of Commerce Award for Environmental Leadership. It really inspired a lot of the people in our company to take this to the next level. We, uh, last year we hired our first co-op student who had, it's, there's a master's program in sustainability at Western University. And so we brought this person on uh, for four months to help us develop policies, a newsletter. Uh, he developed the logo as well too. Today we have um, our, our, this year's uh, co-op student, Joe, is with me today. Joe, quick wave. Uh, he's from Toronto though, and, and, but he is working out of our, uh, our Kitchener store. <clears throat> we also did, we also, I'm, just, I'm gonna share a couple of the unique things that we do. Just maybe it'll inspire you to, to try a couple interesting things, but on, on your tables I left these thank you seed cards. And we really struggled with one component of the garbage that we take away from customers' homes during a delivery, and that was wood. What do we do with scrap wood? So we figured out a way to turn it into mulch, and that way now we can tell our customers that everything we're pulling out of your home, plastic, um, styrofoam, cardboard, and uh, the wood, it's all recycled. So we, we, we give out these thank you cards, and on the back is uh, mulch that's made into our exclamation point and there's wildflower seeds embedded in it, and so you can plant that. And it really sends a nice message. So part of it's about the optics. Uh, we, like, uh, we put charge, car charge stations in, in Kitchener. This was our first store, and we just put one in London the other day, and we're putting um, two of them in, in our Sarnia location coming up. This is a really unique thing for the furniture industry. Uh, we, foam is a big problem for landfills today, and so we're trying to figure out what can we do with all that foam and I was in visiting a store in Texas and I saw this thing called a foam emulsifier so I, we bought two of them and it, it, it melts the foam um, into probably one one hundredth of what it was originally and then we sell the we sell the condensed foam back to uh, recyclers it's really a cool thing uh, Earth Day we, we, we this was the first year where we really jumped on Earth Day and our staff had shirts and pins and we bought 2,000 of these four inch saplings that we were giving out to our customers who walked in, just part of the optics too. 
uh, we plan to have these for the whole weekend, but I think we gave we ran out after the first four hours. So it really again resonates with customers today about environmentalism. And then we went to a park and we planted some trees in a park. One of our um, employees, Linda, who's here today, developed a partnership, a really unique partnership with one of the schools here in town. And we are, we're teaching them about environmentalism and sustainability. So the students actually come to our store and, they, and we've developed a really interesting PowerPoint presentation. We teach them about sustainability and uh, we actually help them plant gardens at their school as well. The middleman would then sell the products to the recyclers. We found an organization called uh, Youth Opportunities Unlimited who act as the middleman, but when, so they pay us for our, our recycled material and then they sell it to the recycler and make a bit of a profit and they take that profit and invest it into the community. So it's really an interesting thing where we're able to help both sides. Um, this is one of the most unique things we've ever done. Used mattresses are a huge problem in landfills all over the world, basically. And what I'm learning is it's not just that it takes up a lot of space, but when the machines go over it and try to compress it into the landfills, the, um, the metal, the springs, gets caught up in the machines and it's very expensive to fix. So we partnered with, um, it's a division of Western called the Institute for Chemicals and Fuels from Alternative Resources. And we're funding a program in combination with the City of London and now the province wants to be a part of this too. And we're gonna be using uh, extreme heat and pressure to turn the foam and mattresses into a, a more value added product. So we, this just kicked off and we should know in about a year um, if this is gonna work or not, but this could be revolutionary uh, for the world basically if it works. We also do uh, unique partnerships with the MBA students at University of Windsor. And this year, the 45 students were challenged on coming up a, with a really interesting program for Tepperman's on corporate social responsibility. So we're now just starting to implement some of these ideas that they've come up with. Uh, messaging is really important, so we message this on our website and around our stores. And lastly, governance is really important. Um, we, 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 we publish on our website and internally on the impact of what we're doing. Last year, 76% of everything we produced was diverted from, la from landfills, so that was a good number for us. This year, we're up to 88% right now, and we have a goal of diverting 100% of all of our waste by the year 2025. Uh, we also look at, you know, um, what does that mean with, you know, water and trees and the impact uh, of, of saving some of those things there. Uh, we look at the weight of the products that we're um, recycling as well. I think it was over 300 uh, tons last year and I think that might be it so thank you and uh, looking forward to your questions thank you Andrew uh, that's that's fascinating retail is is uh, those of us in the business community would can would know is uh, can be a challenge but uh, it's amazing to see how uh, Tepperman's is investing in both co corporate social responsibility and environmental um, uh, technologies to, uh, to, be to benefit not only your company but the community as well. So a message that everyone in retail can, uh, uh, should be considering. Our, our final panelist is Francois Troufin. Uh, he's the Director of Technology and Innovation uh, for Union Gas and Enbridge Company. In his role he leads a group who man whose mandate is to develop and implement new technologies, innovations, business models, partnerships and investment opportunities that will help the company better serve its customers and contribute to Ontario's climate change goals. His career began over two decades ago in Germany as the director of operations for a direct marketing firm. In a subsequent role with a consulting firm, he delivered the company's first contract with Bombardier Transportation Continental Europe. Uh, this le led to a 15-year position with projects in Europe, Asia, and the Americas, having him working on, strat um, working on strategy, project management, operations and supply chain management. Francois earned a bachelor's degree in economy and com communication sciences from the West German Academy for Communication in Cologne, Germany, and an MBS from the University of Western Ontario's Richard Ivey Business School. Please welcome uh, Francois, welcome. For giving me the time to talk a little bit about Union Gas and uh, technology innovation today. Um, and it's an honor to be, uh, to be with such dis distinguished panelists. I don't know if you noticed, but what I noticed is that 
because it's such an interesting and very diverse perspective that each of you bring to the table, so I'm looking forward to the conversation. Um, now, in terms of presentation, we, tend, we typically have, Tuning Gas have a tendency to do presentations, so I wanted to do the same thing. And then, as I was discussing with one of my colleagues, Bart Pitek, we said, okay, it's about technology innovation, so let's do something a little bit different. Uh, especially in the, in, in the Chatham, uh, so, sorry, in the Kitchener-Waterloo region, you know us, you know Union Gas for a long time. So, um, I, as you know, we serve about 400 communities. And as you can see, energy and the energy that Union Gas delivers is actually very, very well. It's part of everything that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so I like that video. I think it, it kind of a better, it presents Union Gas a lot better than I would do. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about what my group is doing and why I'm here today. So I'm responsible for the Technology Innovation Group. So it's, it's a group that was created last year by our president, Steve Baker with the intent of looking in the future and see how the, the world is evolving. There are some key markers and pointers that we already know about, such as regulation, the cap and trade uh, plan that was put in place by the, by, the, uh, by the Ontario province, the climate change action plan. Those are markers that are showing us we're evolving in a low carbon economy. And with that in mind, based on those markers, we, my team and I, we have the pleasure and the luxury to actually look in the future. And, and focus on that future as part of our day-to-day. -day. We look at technologies that are out there and we say, okay, if portions of that future were to become real, what is it that I can do today to influence that future in a positive manner for the benefit of all of you and the rest of our customers in this province? This is what we do on a day-to-day. -day. Um, our company, Union Gas, is evolving um, if you, and you might not necessarily be used to this perspective of union gas, where you think of us as a utility delivering natural gas, but we are evolving. Part of our vision for the future is to become an integrated energy solutions provider. We are going to evolve into becoming source agnostic. For us, um, we deliver and we're ex excellent at delivering natural gas, but we can also help you, our customers, with um, electricity so solutions, with hydrogen solutions, with energy storage solutions, solar solutions, and many other solutions that some of them we don't even know about. So with that in mind, this is what my group is doing. Um, there are a couple of questions that are gonna come later on so we can talk a little bit more in detail about some of the solutions that we're doing. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the conversation. We have five, five minutes. I'm really actually excited about the conversation. So thank you. Well, thank you to Toiva for, for providing with that. I think if any of you have been to the, uh, uh, the community celebration they have every year, it is something to behold, something that started seven years ago, at least uh, when I joined the chamber, it was a pretty small gathering. Now there are literally hundreds and hundreds of people that come from those 75 companies, and it's, uh, it really is an impressive uh, um, a program that, that people are, are um, uh, businesses are, are participating in and, and taking advantage of. So, um, Maybe to get started, I, I want to maybe start with Claire. Um, you talked about, uh, and, and it, it's important we have large institutions that are taking some leadership in, in these sorts of things, but you've been working with the, your local hydro utility and the Save on Energy folks. What are, how, are they the folks that you worked with at least initially to try and figure out how you, uh, how you develop the business case for making these, these large investments? Because any business, big or small, that's making investment will need to have that business case. Who did you work with to develop that, the, uh, the business case? Sure. Um, so for us initially, and, and where I think um, organizations really have to start is, we didn't initially work with um, the utilities on developing the business case, because it has to start with your organization's mission. How can you further... Um, your organization's mission and for us that's education. Um, so we really engaged um, where the university wanted to go, what our constraints were, and developed a business case around that. Um, we brought in, because it's education, we actually engaged our MBA group, similar to what you guys have done in Western, which is really great. There's a fantastic group of students. So based on how our organization functions, so how we administrate um, centrally or decentrally, we had to come up with a financial model that worked for us. We did not have a mechanism to capture energy savings for projects that we did in-house, so we knew, um, and this is what the MBA group uh, did, came to in their final conclusions and presented to our VP of Admin and Finance. 
Um, taking into account, of course, in that business case, the available incentives. That's key because if we're proposing this sort of model and the scope, what it actually means, they want to see the sorts of projects we're doing. And if we're going to be taking on something so large as a central plant, which is huge, we want to know that there's available incentives such as the ISO 40% funding, um, lighting incentives, which we just got a big check for, I think, this week, um, and picture op with my my project manager, then that has to be documented. But I would really suggest for organizations to um, first link to what your mission is. Our mission isn't sustainability. Our mission is education. So how can doing an energy management plant further that? And it can further it by putting more money and more dollars back into education and learning because utilities is one of our well, probably our biggest expenditure every year. It's huge and it's getting larger and we can forecast that. So developing the business case was a part of that, taking in the learning environment and the academic side based on our own, um, the way we work administratively as an institution, we're a long-term entity. So again, an ESCO is a guaranteed savings model um, and we were able to actually convince senior administration to do a long-term payback because we are an institution, we're around for a long time and in order to be more progressive and more sustainable, uh, we needed a little bit longer of a payback and we were successful in that. Great. Um, maybe a follow-on. The next three questions are going to go through, uh, start with Francois talking about, mm -hmm. you know, your, maybe talk more in detail about the integrated energy solutions uh, for, for commercial entities and I think that's, that's where some of the focus is on today. Who and how are you, you are involved in that? Because I, th I think it's important for people to see how how you have to fit all these pieces together. And then we'll come to uh, to GHD and and um, uh, and and how you're working with clients, and then ultimately an end, end user like uh, uh, like Tepperman's. But w what is involved in the integrated um, energy solutions that uh, that that Union Gas is is doing with in, on the corporate side and for commercial users? Okay, excellent. So. <clears throat> Thanks for the question. So I, I kind of played a little bit of a game with you when I told you I don't have a presentation. I actually do have one. <laughs> it's only two pages. <laughs> so if we could open it for a moment. And the reason why I have those two pages is because we tend generally to, uh, to use words and words mean different things to many people. So I just wanted to make sure that we all have a level set of what, what I mean. So to answer to your question, so my, group's ma my, my group is focused on two major aspects. On the one side, we're looking at greening the pipe, uh, so it greening our infrastructure, looking, doing all kinds of technologies like part to gas, so we're using excess electricity to create, uh, to create hydrogen that can be, in, 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 can be put into our infrastructure, so thereby we're greening our infrastructure. That's one aspect. The one aspect that you're asking, which is really about integrated energy solutions starts with a premise of what does the future integrated home looks like or what does the future integrated commerce looks like even in the retail so even today you can see if you look around in a home you can see there's solar there's you know there's solar pvs you can have all kinds of heating options from micro chp to air source heat pump to geothermal and all of these things they have to speak together somehow in a way that it, it does two things. On the one side, it actually reduces the cost to the resident or to the small business or commercial owner, because we know that costs are really an important aspect of what we're trying to do. And the other aspect, which is really, really important from an environmental perspective, Union Gas is really committed, and we, we, we've committed for a long time to actually reduce our environmental footprint, reduce our GHG emissions. Uh, and for context, uh, for those of you in this room who have, who have that, had that opportunity, we're doing demand site management or DSM projects since 1997. So we're helping businesses and residents to reduce their consumption. Now we're bringing it to the le next level and we try to do it in a way that is more modern and a lot more efficient. So that's the concepts of what we have in mind. If we go on the next page, um, then you'll see how do we envision this. So. If you could go just for one on the next page, I don't have to. Okay, so it all starts with what is it that we want to do? So at the beginning, it starts with a partnership with a technology provider. That technology provider, and if I'm taking as an example micro CHP or micro generation, which is using a fuel source to create a combi out combined output of heat and electricity, this is micro CHP. CHP at the 
commercial level, hospitals are using this for a long time. At the micro level, at home, that's not available. There are about a thousand installation in, in the States and there is significantly less in, in Canada. So if we think about this CHP, we find a technology provider, then we need to find a builder, or in another case, we could work with somebody like Temperman who says, okay, I want to make sure that I reduce my, my footprint, I have resiliency, I have um, accessibility all the time to uh, electricity and to heat, then we could use CHP. We build that partnership. The next thing is actually to demonstrate, to work in demonstrating that the technology works. And in that context, you're using, you're looking at financial uh, elements, you're looking at that data. Today, in today's world, data is really important. Data can help us to make decisions with respect to, um, to everything from is the technology working through to uh, is the technology delivering the savings that we're looking for. And in the end, what the, the output of that is actually a, a model that is being deployed and that everybody in this province has access to. And across all that, so all those steps, you can see that it involves strategic partnerships with people who know their business better than we do because Union Gas doesn't know, we, nor do we have the ambition to know everything. What we want to make sure is that we partner with everybody who knows their stuff very, very well ac along the value chain so that in the end we're in a situation where we can provide those, uh, those to you. So if you want like three keywords, it's about partnering with the right people who know it um, who know what they do, and it's really about strategic partnerships in terms of you know working with with others, not the technology only, but you know it could be banks, it could be commerces, it could be uh, it could be uh, you know uh, uh, people from the academia, mm -hmm. and in the end, it's about delivering savings and GHG reductions to this province. Great. Well, I, I guess the follow on maybe for for Julian is I mean the trends in in the supply. You talked in in your presentation about about the various components within industry sectors. So as an example, if you, if you looked at, uh, you talked about mining, you talked about a number of the different, different sectors, uh, manufacturing. Um, how does the supply chain affect uh, people uh, or businesses getting, getting involved in environmental progressivity? Because you have not only the, the company itself, so in this case, you know, as an example, using Tepperman's, you know the company is involved in it, but there's other other aspects that need to feed into that if you're really going to have an integrated um, uh, uh, conservation or, or energy um, plan. Maybe talk a little bit about that because I think we have we'll have large companies that will have lots of suppliers into that into that chain. How do those pieces fit together? Because there'll be many small businesses in the chamber that su that support large entities, <coughs> whether it's in auto or or food processing in in this community. Maybe talk a little bit about about that those connections. Sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I had a slide up earlier which showed um, sort of uh, diff the five stages of a sustainability journey, and uh, <clears throat> if you'll recall, it sort of the basic level is somebody a company that's at the compliance type level, but it it works up from there through stages of some uh, companies that uh, take on, you know, a. Um, uh, embrace sustainability from the standpoint of looking at their internal operations, deciding where they can make improvements, acting upon it, uh, continuously um, monitoring their progress, collecting data. Um, I've, I've been involved in collecting data for uh, probably far too many years, so I, I have a good sense of what kind of data is useful and what, what is not. There's, there's obviously some danger in, in collecting data that really can't be used. Uh, I'm, I'm going a little off topic here. Uh, but, um, and then Andrew's example, I thought was very good from the standpoint of um, incorporating, um, you know, not, not only looking at environmental footprint issues related to, you know, a, a boundary of operations within the company, but, but also looking at what happens, you know, up and down the supply chain or, or the use, in his case, the use of a particular product. Um, looking at the life cycle uh, associated with mattresses, for example. That's, that's really critically important, I think, because it's often overlooked when people look at their own environmental footprint, they're looking specifically you know, through, a, through a narrow lens, perhaps. So I, I really commend you for that. That's fantastic. Um, as far as supply chain goes, um, it, it's, it's entities like, like what Andrew is doing, and there's, there's a, a large number of companies that you know, have the same sort of philosophy, but they, they recognize that um, 
you know, they need to look beyond their own boundaries. They need to look at what's going on within their supply chain. And, and what we see quite a lot of recently is um, companies, I, I deal a lot with the automotive sector. So, you know, they, they have a, a really long supply chain. They drive down uh, their sustainability programs to their suppliers. They, they require them to look specifically at their own, you know, their own impacts. Uh, they have very detailed uh, questionnaires. Uh, that uh, that they send out to their suppliers to require them to you know explain what their sustainability program is about, what kind of targets they've established, what kind of progress they're making. Um, to be honest, I'm not I'm not really sure, you know, what the uptake is on that in terms of how how it really influences their decisions. But but I I think what we see is that is becoming more and more common, is for you know. Uh, the, the leaders and sustainability programs to uh, make sure that um, you know they're they're sourcing materials and they're buying services and products from other companies that have a similar kind of vision. So so maybe Andrew, I mean to, to follow along on that. I mean you, you talked in your presentation about it, it, it's something that that corporately at the senior management in your family decided was was an important issue. I'm interested in in and in, in grassroots. How did you get like what were what did you do once you've made that decision to actually get your employees to buy into that because that that's an important part you can't you're not always in the front line you're you're looking for, uh, for to your staff to deliver on on a bunch of this how did you what, what was the mechanism that you chose with your staff you have a large staff across many different facilities what are the things you did to to engage your your employees to to really deliver on that i think the first thing was when we came back from ann arbor and we were we I was nervous because we never had a 10-year vision or guiding principles, so I didn't know how our team was going to react to it. And so before announcing it company-wide on here's the vision on where we want to go with, you know, one of them being sustainability, I did a test with some of my employees first, and I ran, ran it through to see if it was going to resonate with them. I um, did the same thing with some of our business suppliers and some of the board members that we have. And across the board, everyone felt really good about it. So that was the first thing was, are these the right things to be focused on? Um, the second thing was, you know, then how do, you, how do we get people to start to live it? Because you don't want it to be top down. Mm -hmm. It's gotta be you know, frontline, grassroots, organic to really work. And Kitchener is a perfect example. So we opened up uh, last year, July 12th, and we had this in place, sustainability and you know, what we wanted to do company-wide, but our Kitchener team, is the first team that developed their own sustainability group without anybody telling them. And they developed their own newsletter outside of the Tepperman's newsletter. And it's a great case study for our company to look at when someone really buys into it and believes in it. So that we're gonna take the Kitchener model and try to translate it now to our other stores. And that surprised me because I thought for sure it would have started in our head office store first and then we would have to push it out. But it was quite, quite the reverse at that point. Now, another side of that is, you know, how do you make it work within a company? I find it's very uh, demographic driven too, where we, when we did that study with the 45 MBA students, we asked each one of them individually, when you walk into a Tepperman store or when you go online, what message do you want to be hit with first? Is it our, is it our 92 year history with my grandfather on his bicycle going door to door? <laughs> is it um, all the community stuff we do? Is it our great prices and selection? Is it our financing? And 100% of the students who were between ages of 25 and 30 said, no, no, talk about environmentalism, talk about sustainability, because that's what our values align with. So that was an eye-opening thing for us. And when I go across internally in our company right now, I find that it really is a different demographic that, um, that buys into this a lot more. And so hopefully we'll be able to use that demographic group to make it grow within the company. Well, I think that's interesting because one of the things we, over the course of the last seven years, and I'm, I wanna go back to, uh, to Claire in a second, um, a lot of these environmental programs and with our friends from Save on Energy, you know, sometimes we, we default to saying the, the number one thing is how much can you save? Um, and I think we're seeing a mix of that needs to be part of it, especially for small and medium sized business because the bottom line does drive your success. But maybe coming to Claire uh, on that point, um, what's the mix? I mean, when you, when you went through this, you had, to, you had to present the business plan, you developed that. 
Uh, you, and you have to measure that somewhere too. And I think Andrew talked about that and, and at France One and, uh, and Julian and Parts have as well. You have to measure that. Uh, how much of it is on the payback and on the return on investment in terms of hard cash and, and output versus community engagement and sort of the, some of those social um, or, or environmental imperatives as well? Because I think that's, that's important to see how you, because how, they're, they're all part of, I, I presume, they're all part of how you measure that. Uh, what, what emphasis is put on, on the numbers versus, or the, the finance versus those other aspects? Um, it, it's, you're extremely correct there. I mean, efficiencies are very important. You need to have those numbers for senior management. Um, your folks are very lucky to have you because senior management's already engaged. Uh, it's not generally, uh, doesn't generally exist for everyone that didn't at Laurier. Um, we're also, so we really used other motivators such as compliance measures coming up. We talked about um, having the provincial legislations coming. We're already required to report on GHG emissions. Um, now there's cap and trade, which um, affects our industry. So we had kind of compliance as a driver. And then reputation is a big one. So reputation is not just the institutional sector wanting to be a leader in academia and progressive measures because we're a university, the private absolutely can capitalize on that. Uh, getting your name in the news um, and through um, associations like Sustainable Waterloo or whoever is publishing your story, that is fantastic press for especially a private organization who is not a nonprofit, isn't getting funding. So that's extremely key and it was for us. And so for all of these business cases, we had to, it's, you have to know your, the audience for students we take a different approach than we will with senior management. Um, senior management loves the recognition we're getting, um, absolutely, and they, they do um, tout that a lot of times in, the, in their board meetings and externally. Uh, we just received, um, found out a few days ago, we received the Minister's Award in Environmental Excellence, so I get to have a lunch with Glenn Murray tomorrow, and this is all great press for us, and, and we get to celebrate that when there's a, sometimes not the great best press coming out. Um, we're obviously in budget constraints, a lot of people are, so partnerships are kind of the new way forward. So uh, another rationale is, is making these partnerships. We have the community ones on the social side, but um, working with uh, utilities and other funding bodies has been huge for us. We would not be able to have achieved the payback period that our university was comfortable with without the incentive programs. So, um, you, and a lot of people just aren't taking advantage of them. They're, they're too busy, so they're not putting it within their capital planning, design, and construction standards to even look into them. Um, and they're, so there's a lot of projects, I think, being missed. So it's up to us uh, to take time and, and really capture those. But our partners can help us, and uh, North Waterloo Hydro especially, I mean, they're the ones working with um, our proponents to fill out the major IASO funding. So they're facilitating all of that, which is absolutely key for us. Partnerships are essential to do especially large projects like this, but, but small ones as well, and um, those incentives are available. So it's, I think it is just really knowing your audience, making, making the business case based on um, the mission of your organization, and, and we really, the students are our customers. I don't love to say the customers, but they kind of are, and so we have to um, really try to connect with students, but also make their experience better via energy management. So it's not as easy because um, our bottom line is certainly not measured just with financial terms. Um, and it's, it makes for complicated projects. Doing, uh, you can imagine doing a campus-wide, multi-campus-wide project, a uh, $55 million project from fixtures and weather sealing and everything else during um, business hours, during uh, class hours. Is, <laughs> there's a lot of stakeholders. There's hotel lorry mm -hmm. in the summer. There's, you know, it, it is, um, it's hard to do. You don't want to upset anyone. You really want people engaged on this. So selling what you're doing as a really um, exciting project is just as important. So we're, we're getting together a strategy this summer to really sell what we're doing and the, and the importance of that because we don't want to upset people, we want to excite them with what we're, we're doing. So communication on top of everything, so you do your business case, once you can finally get the approval and start going, you really need to sell yourself because it's amazing how easily it is to piss off faculty. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, Julian, maybe, maybe talk to, in, in your presentation, you talked about the, uh, the, the key performance indicators. Those are three, three sections. There was social, there was economic and, and environmental. Um, maybe talk about, about why those are important to, to identify at the outset. I mean, you know, because you can do some improvements and then measure it at the back end. Why, why, do you, why are you talking about 
doing that at the, at the front end before you even develop the plan is, is develop that first. So that's, that's the, the one aspect. I'm, I'm interested in, in, in the importance of doing that. And the second thing as related to that is how, how, I mean, some of these, what we've talked about have been larger projects or larger companies. Can you talk a little bit about how a, a more of a, a smaller, medium-sized business should be, t should be looking at these to be an opportunity for them as well? Uh, sure. Um, okay, so uh, the, uh, everybody's probably seen the, this Venn diagram that shows this, um, you know, the interaction between economic, environmental, and social factors related to sustainability. And um, there's, there's, this, there's this overlap between the three. And there's this uh, sort of mystical, magical place that resides right in the middle where um, you have the, the proper balance of, you know, economic factors relating to environmental factors relating to social conditions. And um, so, you know, often, often there's heavier emphasis on one side versus another. Um, depends on, you know, uh, what the sort of public perception and mood is at the time. Obviously, right now, we're we're pretty heavily engaged in energy and environmental uh, type issues, but um, obviously, um, you know, there's trade-offs associated with how you treat your your environmental aspects versus what that translates into in terms of an economic impact, which you're dealing with, obviously. Um, and then, uh, on a social level, there's there's a whole raft of considerations related to, you know, employee health and safety and impact on the community. Um, so it, it's it's never you know there's there's never never a simple solution in terms of deciding what what is sustainable and it and it can change with time, of, of course according to you know uh, conditions that arise or issues that come up or regulatory drivers, so um, it, it can be easy to lose sight of the fact that there needs to be this balance between all of those things, and so that that's that's what's behind the premise of making sure that at, at the outset you understand what all of those factors are um, because you know as, as you progress through a sustainability program you do from time to time have to sort of reevaluate and decide if you're still on the right track and if those uh, competing factors are still at play in the same in the same way that you thought they were initially so um, that's what that's what this materiality thing is, is really all, all about is making sure you understand how those things interact and decide how to approach them on a continuous basis where you're, you know, tracking information in the way that you need mm -hmm. to make sure that that balance is maintained. Great. And Ian, you had a second part to that well, I, I just wanted to maybe on, talk about how... Well, small uh, companies. Just small companies yeah. should be looking at this. I mean, it, it, you can't go into detail, but um, it's not just for large companies. I mean, we're utilizing right. technologies and new equipment and... and and engaging employees is is for all size of companies. So, but you're you're in the consulting business and working with small, large, and medium sized business. Just a, a few comments on 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 that aspect of it. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, I, I mentioned before the the idea that um, in the supply chain some of these requirements tend to get driven down. And I, I don't want to suggest that that this is a primary driver, but you know there there was a time when. Um, you know, we, we were under scrutiny as a company by our clients, and uh, most of the time it related to, um, it would relate to safety performance. Um, you know, we have, have a lot of clients that work in the industrial sector, the oil and gas sector, and they have this, they have this very heavy preoccupation, and rightly so, with safety issues. Um, so we were being judged on that basis uh, in terms of mon monitoring, you know, our safety data, our safety performance, and, um, you know, it was made plainly clear that there would be a risk um, to our being able to continue actively providing uh, services to some of these companies if, um, if our safety performance threshold, you know, was affected negatively in some way. Um, so that was, you know, that, that, that started happening at least 10 years ago, probably 20 years ago. And, and now everybody's kind of on the same sort of playing field, I think, from a safety standpoint, for the most part. Um, so these, the companies that are looking at these kinds of, you know, scoring mechanisms for looking at their suppliers are, are considering other factors as well, um, environmental performance or social responsibility performance. So if, if I were a smaller company, and particularly if I was 
somewhere in the supply chain and you know a customer of a, of a bigger company as a lot of as a lot of companies are obviously then um, you know I would I would want to make sure that you understand what your uh, customers expectations are great um, go going back to uh, to Francois I mean you talked about in in the uh, the sect the, the department you're in you're developing new technologies and and uh, testing them out, if you will, but also with a view of making them commercially available, whether it's for on the residential side or the commercial side. Maybe talk about 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 that process of of, of how you do the the testing, if you will, or developing the, the program, the partnerships that you have, because ultimately many of these advancements need to be commercially available, especially for again that small and medium sized business, but but uh, um, commercially available to business. Uh, and to, to residential home builders to, to incorporate. So maybe talk a little bit about, about that scalability of some of these advancements. Okay. So there are a couple of questions in there, so I'll try to- I'm sure uh, there are. I could have added a third one if you want. <laughs> yeah, no, why don't we good. start with the first two? <laughs> no, it's, it's all good. So um, the, first, the first portion is about how do we make those technologies available? There was one slide that I showed a little bit earlier with four stages. You know, you need to find the manufacturer, you need to, find the builder or the company that way you want to test it to demonstrate that the technology works in, in Ontario. Then you need to monitor it and verify it and make sure that, you know, not only it works, but it, it, it's con consistent with the regulations, current and upcoming regulations. And in the end, you need to put together a business model that makes sense so that people do get savings. At a very basic level, that's what it is. The reason why it is like this in our case is because, you know, I talked about microgeneration. So microgeneration in Japan, there's, you know, 100,000 units installed already in terms of microgeneration from internal combustion engines, uh, fuel cells, and whatever. I'm not going to go down. Mm -hmm. I'm a techie, so I'm not going to go there. I'm just saying <laughs> there will be, there, there are lots of different technologies available. The reason why in Japan is like this is because I hope most of you remember what happened in in uh, Fukushima with the tsunami back in 2011. So uh, they had a, you know, a, like an environmental impetus to do so. So they're ahead of us. In Germany, just the same. Anybody who's familiar with the electricity prices in, in, uh, in Germany will know that they are going through the similar pains like we do in Ontario where you know, electricity prices are actually a competitive mm -hmm. factor in the decision making of small business, uh, small businesses such as most of you here are. You're thinking about your your expansion. If you're in Ontario, you're thinking about their expansion. Is it here or is it in the states where they give? So, so obviously, um, when you're looking at all of these things, that th that environment drives the development of technologies that are not available here. So, what we need to do is to say. Let's bring them here and test them so that it works. Um, some, you know, I'll give one quick example from a microgeneration perspective because I think it's interesting. So there's a unit from, from the states that we're gonna start testing at the end of the year. The unit has an output of six kilowatt hours of thermal output, six kilowatt hours of, of uh, and I'm saying it in kilowatt hours, although my colleagues from Union Gas will be thinking M cubes, M cubes. <laughs> but, you know, I'm just trying to make it more palatable for everybody. And, it, and also it has um, five kilowatt hours of electrical outputs. And you can daisy chain them. So if you look at a, if you look at a, you know, small commercial uh, business in a plaza somewhere here in, in Ontario, where you're also exposed with, uh, with grid outages, which unfortunately we do have. Ontario House has one of the best electrical systems in the world. In terms of reliability, we are at 97 point something percent measured. The problem is not reliability, the problem is resiliency. So when, you're, when you have an outage, then what do you do? You know, if you have a small restaurant, then your food is gone. If you have uh, you know, a laundromat business, then you might be exposed to pay the, to pay the clothing of everybody who was there at the time. Cause it's so that kind of a micro CHP unit can be used to provide, in collaboration with an electric LDC, can be used to provide that resiliency factor that is so essential for that. The other thing is, so you're thinking this is just technology. So let me bring the economic aspect to it. Natural gas um, in kilowatt hours to make things, to compare things so that everybody understands it, um, we pay in this province anywhere between 15.5 to 18 cents a kilowatt hour of electricity. Natural gas is 3.5. The spark, spark spread is five times. 
So if you're using natural gas microgeneration at peak hour, you can actually get electricity at three and a half cents um, a kilowatt hour. You're saving 80% of your cost in peak hours. So here's an example of how you can use micro, microgeneration with natural gas and have significant savings. And the last piece, which is really interesting, and you're thinking, well, this is more gas, why should we use it? Well, actually not. Because on the one side, solar, you don't have solar all the time. Everybody knows it. We are in the north, you know, we have great weather now and for the next, for the coming, hopefully for the coming two months. But then we're gonna get into in, in winter again. So solar is not there all the time. Having micro, micro uh, generation gives you this, the possibility to actually integrate with solar. So the common denominator between solar and micro CHP is battery storage. Mm -hmm. And this way you start thinking about a solution where you generate electricity on site, you don't have any line grid losses, you're helping this province by not having to spend hundreds of millions do of dollars in expanding the, the electrical infrastructure and still provide the, res the, the resiliency that everybody, every one of us needs on a day-to-day -day uh -huh. business to actually make business in this in, and to conduct business successfully in this province. Great. We're almost, we're coming to our end of our time, but I wanted to ask uh, um, Andrew one more question. I mean, you, you've talked about, uh, and the slides were interesting, you, you, you purchased new equipment, um, and, and you talked about going to a uh, conference in Texas. Um, where, do, where did this, you know, wh where do you get the, uh, the ideas for integrating in, in these? Is it through your association? Like, how are you looking for that next thing, whether it's uh, the foam, recovery of foam or dealing with mattresses? Where are you, f you're identifying a problem. Where are you getting the, um, the help to kind of identify what some of these solutions are? Are you, you really developing these on your own? along with, like as, you, as an example, with, with Western. Like, wh how, do you, how do you identify uh, solutions to those problems? Prior to having a 10-year vision on where we wanted to go, it was really ad hoc. So it could be the Texas solution where we just ran into a retailer who had this foam emulsifier. Um, it could have been you know, six years ago when the whole solar fit program was really hot and everybody was trying to jump on it. But once we had that um, vision in place, now it's more structured. So if part of our plan is to be a zero, is to divert 100% of all of our waste by 2025, we have to have a plan to get there. So there's, so we are looking at that internally on every component that contributes to that waste. Um, we have local, um, local teams who, like I mentioned that whole Kitchener example before, so they're coming up with ideas outside of a head office corporate plan at that point um, it really everything just kind of blends into each other um, the, the other day you know we, we use these uh, service vans to go to people's homes so when their furniture breaks down or they need some touch-up or something like that we have technicians that go there so I'm not involved in buying the service trucks but the other day one of our supervisors said well instead of buying this brand which uses X amount of uh, X amount of liters of, of uh, gas per hundred kilometers, can, can we look at this van, which uses more aluminum, and is lighter, and you know they showed us the ROI. So being you know a small family private business, we can just react very quickly. Sure, let's do that. Let's buy these, this whole new fleet of lighter you know, type vans. That wasn't in our 10 year vision, but on a very high level, it has to do with sustainability at Tepperman's. So it's kind of a mix between both. You know, we have structured things, but anyone at any given time can come up with an idea. We were just talking about in, that, in the car today where Kitchener is our first store where we have a, a cafe serving coffee all day. What do you do with the, um, uh, the cups, the paper cups? And there was a challenge where I don't think they were composting them before. Was that the issue? So I don't know if everybody heard that, but they came up with a really good idea that I wasn't aware of mm -hmm. back at the head office. So anything, anything we can do to help the environment, we're moving pretty quickly on. That's great. Now, um, I'm just gonna make a couple of comments and then ask for some concluding remarks from, from each of you. Uh, I think one of the context pieces of, of this, uh, of, of, of the day is electricity prices are, are skyrocketing and that's a real issue for, uh, not only consumers, but for, for business. Um, 
there, there's, you know, either in Ontario cap and trade or across the country, but you're going to either have cap and trade uh, or a carbon tax, we'll take your pick, um, which, are gonna, which does influence business. Um, and there are government programs and government incentives in, in, in trying to, to support or incent um, movement on, on both environmental and, and energy conservation uh, and, and progressive programs. So I guess the, the question from, from each of you, from your own lens, what are, what are we doing well in, in terms of that is, that is leading us down the path that I think we, we collectively as a, as a country and as a, as, a, as a community need to go? And where are some of the areas that we need to improve? So whether that's government or in, within business, what's, what's, what's happening that you think is really positive and what do you think we need to improve on? Maybe that's, that's the way we can, we can close up today. And we'll start, we'll start with Claire. Thanks. Um, I just want to, I mean, maybe tie it together with um, firstly saying there absolutely are government um, from every level incentives available right now and the only catch is you have to be shovel ready pretty much. We're getting an email saying present us with a GHG. It's now what's your GHG reducing project for funding and this is not just at the institutional level. Um, this is through cap and trade, which is all levels. So we have to be ready within a few days to provide what the actual savings are in uh, units and GHGs. So having this information, having the plans established um, and in place has been a savior for us and it's allowing us to get other funding. So we, we didn't even have um, external funding secured through the government um, before we started the ESCO with our business case and we, we've gotten it since because of what we're already doing. Um, and then, so this has been a big strength. I think policy needs to catch up a little bit more. I mean, there's a lot of different moving parts. Uh, communities need to work together and legislation needs to facilitate that um, because we have all of this great R&D um, and technology that's ready to go. I think just our policy hasn't quite ca caught up. It's, it's going to, hopefully we can stick with um, and not hate the Liberals too much because the reason why um, electricity prices are going up are for good reasons. Um, they're to actually get us to a progressive state. We have to remember we, we do not have the highest prices of energy in the world, even though we think that we do sometimes. Um, this is just the way we need to move forward, uh, whether you like it or not. It's, uh, it's, it's the best for everyone. But um, just kind of to finalize um, our balanced approach, and it's interesting to kind of hear what you folks are saying. And um, we do have to provide that balanced approach. So for our senior management, we're, we're absolutely doing a natural gas cogen, but for our image as a progressive um, institution, we're also doing that with microgrid power storage and renewables, and and so we're we're it's kind of nice we're taking the a bit of the pieces. It, it does make sense in terms of financials to do natural gas, and um, so why wouldn't we do that? I don't ever propose anything that doesn't make business sense, um, but you know you always want to try to. Um, embed a little bit of the sustainability and innovation side as well, and if you can hash off some deferred maintenance as a part of that, then you're real, you're a real hero. So, that's Thank you. Yeah. Julian. Um, yeah, I, I think um, I think certainly uh, we're 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 a lot farther ahead than we were, you know, five ten years ago in terms of public awareness, and that and that I think stems out of. Um, what you were just saying, Claire, in terms of you know where the where the government's going, where they're driving us to, um, you know everybody has an opinion about um, you know wh whether how that's being accomplished, whether it's going in the right direction. But obviously, what it's done is it generates conversation. It gets people thinking about um, what um, you know what what are the implications of higher electricity prices? How can we how can we um, you know uh, deal with that competitively? Um, the, um, the, the other thing I, I guess I, I would say though is um, on the downside because you know, we, we are in the cycle of having public awareness issues like this being put in front of us um, that um, there's some unknown in terms of longer term you know, economic consequences that what that means for businesses in particular going forward. Um, so, you know, that, that drives obviously some uh, entrepreneurship as well in terms of microgrid technology utilizing uh, renewable natural gas. Uh, there, there are plenty of options out there. So it's going to require, I think, you know, a lot of thought from a lot of people to, to steer us in the path forward. Great. Andrew? <clears throat> yeah, just to um, 
you know, continue with what Julian was saying about it gets people thinking. I think that's the most important thing right now. You know, when I drive up and down the 401 and I see the uh, solar farms and the wind turbines, I don't really know if that's good or bad what's happening from an economic sense, but it looks good. And it, it makes, I think, um, the, the general public out there think differently about sustainability. Um, you know, and if I bring that home, what does it do to our own team? Well, it gets them to come up with that idea like finding lighter, uh, lighter vans, lighter weight vans. Um, the other day, another supervisor said, instead of sourcing our uniforms for the warehouse from this company, I found another company where they use more organic cottons and they don't use the chemicals to treat things. So that whole education thing out there, I think, is getting better right now. I'm really excited to see what everything's going to look like here in 10 years from now. If this is where we are already, it's just amazing when we start bringing on technologies, what we can do um, as a province or as a country. Um, and, but on the other side of that, I think the opportunity is still a lot of education. I think there's still a lot of issues with it. Um, I know when anybody buys a TV from us, we have to put this a line item on a charge called the environmental stewardship fee. I have no idea where that money goes, but millions of dollars I've no given to somebody <laughs> for this. So I hope they're treating those electronics well. Um, and then I, I found out we're also paying this other massive fee. So every time we send out our flyers in the newspaper, we're charged a fee for that as well. So hopefully somebody's doing something with that. Um, but I think education. I like the fact that your your glass is half full and that that's. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ask me after what I really think about it. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I think there is education is really important. Good, Francois. Um, okay, so I'm going to leave you with two uh, two uh, complementary messages. On the one side, um, I think innovation takes two different and what apparently uh, contradictory mindsets, um, and they're not contradictory at all. On the one side, when you look at your day-to-day -day business, when you look at your tactical, like you know, in your business or in our business, we need to be safe, we need to perform at the best level mm -hmm. possible, and our customers need to be exactly happy. So it's about core business, and you, there's very limited to no risk, no room for risk taking. And that's essential to our business, we need to keep that. The, what seems to be contra contradictory is the other side, and I invite all of you today to, to do this, is to think about innovation as, as, an, as an experiment, as a failure by design. You need to do as much po as possible technology innovation projects for the sake of discovery. You need to fail by design because the more you're failing by design during demonstration projects, the less problems your customers are going to have when you're actually there you're doing your core, where you can afford um, failures. So what seems to be an, a, a, a contradiction, an oxymoron, it's actually not. You need to integrate in your business, in your day-to-day -day life, two co competing um, mentalities. On the one side, you need to be really safe, and on the other side, you need to experiment with things you just don't know so that you can push your business forward. Um, and, and, and be patient with technology. There are technologies that many years ago didn't work, so, or were not uh, economical, like solar, like compressed natural gas, or like renewable natural gas. Many years ago, you tried, it, you tried mm -hmm. we tried, and we failed. And it's fine. That same technology is not the same today. The price per kilowatt hour of solar energy is down and continuously goes down. It becomes more and more affordable. So. Solar, it's interesting today. It may, it may have not been interesting 20 years ago. So that's why test and fail as much as you, po as you possibly can and celebrate failures as part of your, just be, be a kid again. You know, kids were failing and then we step up again and failing and step up. That's my invitation to you. And the reason why I'm saying that this is the second part of my message is, and goes back to your question. Our president, Steve Baker, um, he says the following, and he says this consistently, and my, co my colleagues at Union Gas will attest to that. He always says, we must balance between the economy, the environment, and affordability. The key is to be at that nexus. If you're an engineer and you're thinking Venn diagrams, you need to be in that perfect spot between those three elements. If you're able to do this, and, and they're each, of it, each of them, they're equally important. If you're in that spot, 
we will be able to continue to drive in this, in this province and in this country, and we'll continue to be able to do amazing things from an environmental perspective as well. That's a great place to leave it, and I, I think that that's, uh, we hear more of that from the technology community, actually, which is failure by design, is that you, when you're innovating, that, uh, that they're not as afraid to, to say we tried something and it didn't work, because it's the next step in, in progress. So I think that that's important. And environmental progress uh, it pays off in many ways. I think that's been a common theme. Education and public awareness need to be, you know, I, I think uh, uh, really um, uh, accelerated because I think it, we need to understand what programs are available, how to access them for businesses of all size. So those are some great takeaways. Listen, we're going to leave it there. I want to, uh, Dana's going to pass out a book. I want to thank our panelists from today, Claire from Wilford Laurier, Julian from uh, GHD, um, Andrew from Tepperman's, and Francois from Union Gas. As a mem as a token of our appreciation. I want to give you each a copy of, uh, of a book that we did a couple of years back called County oh, Roots, thank you. Global Reach. Uh, and it's a book that really uh, we, we, we designed and, and worked on um, for over two years. And it really reflects the entire region of Waterloo. It's, it, there, are, there are businesses, community partners, um, uni the universities uh, from right across the region, from each city, each, each township. Um, the hospitals and universities, everything that makes Waterloo Region what it is as a, as a place to do business. And I think you'll, you'll get a, a great reflection of, of what, the, what the community has to offer. So we hope you'll, you'll enjoy that. It is also available online, and I think it's on our website. Uh, it, so you can see it electronically um, um, as, as you share it with your, uh, with your um, colleagues and, and customers. So thank you all very much for participating today. And just before we wrap up, I do want to thank... Uh, um, once again, all of our sponsors, um, uh, to Kitchener, Wilmot Hydro and Waterloo North Hydro, thank you very much for being our title sponsor. Our gold sponsor is Tepperman's today, silver sponsor GHD, and our community sponsor, uh, the S Sustainable Waterloo Region. These events don't happen without the, uh, with, as I said before, without this generous support of our corporate and, and community partners, and we thank you very much for supporting the Chamber. To all of you, thank you for spending your uh, part of, portion of your day with us and continuing to make the